Greetings. This is to be a lecture on Immanuel Kant and his um, metaphysics and epistemology. And it is the actual final one I think we'll be doing in this course on metaphysics and epistemology. And it actually builds on the various lectures that we've been uh, reviewing so far. So hopefully you'll see this as kind of a, a logical continuation of some of the topics that we've been talking about in this module. So let me, here we go. Okay, so this is Kant's epistemology and metaphysics, or as we shall uh, see in a bit, um, well, it's actually his epistemology and not metaphysics, but we'll talk about that a bit more in just a second. So rather than asking, is knowledge possible? Kant is asking what he takes to be a more fundamental question, which is how is it that knowledge is possible? So knowledge is possible. We're able to know things. He kind of begins there, but says, but how is this possible? How, what is it that makes knowledge possible? So the key Kantian insight, which we'll be spending a fair amount of time unpacking, is that our minds are not passive in experience, but rather active. Mind constructs experience out of the raw sense data that it receives. Sometimes this is referred to as Kant's Copernican revolution in epistemology. So what it is that, it, uh, where he thinks epistemology went wrong and why in the early modern era, we ended up with skepticism, both from the rationalist side of the, uh, uh, of the pond and the empiricist side of the pond. He thinks we ended up at skepticism because we were asking the wrong questions and we had misconceived the nature of perception and knowledge. So we'll talk about that. One of the most significant developments in modern epistemology, and again, I'm talking about from the time of Descartes on, was the rejection of direct realism and the adoption of representational realism. Of course, we've talked about that quite a bit now. We have already looked at how both Descartes and Locke dealt with questions of how one moves from mental representations of reality to knowledge about reality itself. However, it's not clear that either of these two resolutions uh, is entirely successful. Modern rationalists ended up with the sort of skepticism of Descartes, and modern empiricists ended up with the skepticism of David Hume. Something is terribly wrong with this picture, or at least so Kant thought. Recall that Plato anticipated that experience alone could not account for knowledge, but his solution was rejected by subsequent philosophers as too spooky. So Plato, you recall, thinks that we come to knowledge of eternal forms, not through experience uh, and our sensory exchanges with the world, but in some sort of prenatal, precorporeal existence where our souls or our psyches were in the presence of the eternal forms. Nevertheless, as spooky as that answer might be, as Raphael Demos points out, um, Plato is actually uh, bringing our attention to what is an undeniable fact. Quoting from Demos, he says, the transcendental theory is only an interpretation of the immediate fact that experience fails to account for knowledge. The doctrine of the limitation of empiricism remains, whatever one's view about the origin of abstract ideas may be. So there's a problem to be solved here, and you may not care for Plato's, so a solution to the problem, but nevertheless, the problem remains. As we have seen, the empiricism of Aristotle avoids the limitations of Locke and company only by an appeal to active intellect or noose, now largely discredited, and direct realism, arguably no less spooky than Plato. So Aristotle's resolution is that we come to uh, acquire these understandings and knowledge of abstract uh, ideas and necessary truths uh, through this um, active intellect that he calls noose, where the mind abstracts forms from particulars. But some have criticized that as not particularly uh, um, uh, clear, or it's not a sufficient explanation, again, somewhat on the spooky side. So is the only alternative to spooky epistemology of Plato and Aristotle uh, epistemological skepticism? Kant does not think so. However, he credits David Hume with posing the problem so clearly. Kant 
uh, will ultimately reject Hume's skeptical conclusions. Nevertheless, he accepts Hume's arguments against traditional metaphysics, and he credits Hume's attack on causality with awakening him from his dogmatic slumber. This is something he says in a quote. Kant had been a metaphysician, a follower of Gottfried Leibniz, but reading Hume convinced him that there was a serious problem, not only for metaphysics, but for our claims to know the world at all. Quoting from Kant, he says, my purpose is to persuade all those who think metaphysics worth studying, that it is absolutely necessary to pause a moment and regarding all that has been done as though undone, to propose first the preliminary question, whether such a thing as metaphysics can even be possible at all. He writes this in a work called Prolegomenon to Any Future Metaphysics. If it be science, Kant says, how is it that it cannot, like other sciences, obtain universal and lasting recognition? If no, how can it maintain its pretensions and keep the human mind in suspense with hopes never ceasing and never fulfilled? Whether then we demonstrate our knowledge or our ignorance in this field, we must come one and for all to a definite conclusion respecting the nature of this so-called science, which cannot possibly re remain on its present footing. It seems almost ridiculous while every other science is continually advancing that in this, which pretends to be wisdom incarnate, for those oracle everyone inquires, we should constantly move round the same spot without gaining a single step. And so its vol volitaries have melted away. We do not find men confident of their ability to shine in other sciences venturing their reputation here. Whether everybody, however, ignorant in other matters presumes to deliver a final verdict, because in this domain, there is actually as yet no standard weight and measure to distinguish sound knowledge from shallow talk. All right, so what is he on about here? Well, here Kant seems to be suggesting that there are two reasons to be deeply suspicious of metaphysics as a genuine form of rational inquiry or science. For one, there doesn't seem to be an unquestionable progress towards greater and greater apprehension of truth. So where we see advance in science, we don't see similar advances in metaphysics. That's what he means about constantly going around the same spot. But second, there doesn't seem to be a universally agreed upon standard of judgment for distinguishing true and false metaphysical theories. And so this is why he says that it's not really clear who the experts would be, since there doesn't seem to be a standard of what constitutes a, a right judgment or correct judgment. He also says in the same work, I openly confess my rec uh, recollection of David Hume was the very thing which many years ago interrupted my dogmatic slumber and gave my investigations in this field of speculative philosophy a quite new direction. So prior to this, he was content to be doing metaphysics as was traditionally done. And he says, no, no, Hume shook me out of that slumber, that comfortable position of assuming that metaphysics was a genuine science and had me asking that question, is it? And if so, how is it supposed to work? And what are its principles and what are its concepts? I was far from following him in his conclusions at which he arrived by regarding not the whole of his problem, but a part which by itself can give us no information. If we start from a well-founded but undeveloped thought, which another has bequeathed to us, we may well hope by continued reflection to advance farther than the acute man to whom we owe the first spark of light. So he says, well, look, um, here's where my inspiration came from Hume. And now that he's given this to me, I can perhaps take the matter further. Okay, spoiler alert, I'm gonna to cut to the chase here, but then we'll spend the rest of this presentation uh, laying this out more. Kant too is dealing with the notion of mental representations. 
But what he's claiming is our mental representations have a dependable, reliable, and even necessary character to them, which is furnished not by the objective world, by the, but rather by the functioning of human cognition itself. The necessity ascribed to metaphysics is in fact only the necessity of how our minds present the world to us. The world of our experience, again, our mental representations, will always appear to conform to these rules because these are the very rules by which human cognition constitutes our experience. The real problem with representational realism, according to Kant, was in imagining that our mental representations somehow have to match up with or correspond to some supposed mind-independent reality. They do not. So he thinks we have the nature of knowledge and truth wrong when we think that the nature of knowledge and truth is correspondence and matching up with some external um, non-mental reality. True theories for Kant are merely theories that are adequate to our human experience of the world. So the theories which adequately um, conform to the world as we experience it are the true ones. Once we know that our theories are empirically adequate, we know that they are true. So it's not a matter of matching up to something outside of our experience, it's merely matching up to our experience, again, being empirically adequate. We need not worry about whether or not they pick out mind-independent ontological things. Indeed, we could never know whether they do or not, according to Kant. But this is just a brief summary of Kant's position. For greater details, please follow me ahead. And Kant, who is also a scientist and an enthusiastic supporter of Isaac Newton and the new physics, saw that he had to refute Hume if he was going to keep claiming that scientists and everyone else could know anything at all. But the problem, as he diagnosed it, turned out to be the unquestioned idea that there was any distinction to be made between our experience of the world on the one hand and the world itself or reality or truth on the other. So the unquestioned assumption is that these are two distinct things that need to somehow match, but he thinks that might be an unfounded, unmerited um, assumption. Ultimately, Kant, Kant rejects not only classical direct realism, but also he rejects modern philosophy's representational realism as well. The view that our perceptions are representations of some extra mental realities, and that truth can only be had when our representations match the way the world really is. That's what he thinks is wrong with modern epistemology prior to him, by the way. We must stop thinking that our perceptions are representations of some extra mental realities and that truth can only be had when these representations match that extra mental reality. Instead, Kant claims that our knowledge is simply knowledge of our experiences alone. This experience is fabricated by active mind. Matching up with the way the world really is has nothing to do with knowledge or truth, and never did, according to Kant. One of the errors which empiricism, uh, which led empiricism to its skeptical conclusions, according to Kant, was their passive view of mind and experience. Think of the passive metaphors employed by John Locke and David Hume, for instance. Locke talks, talks about the mind being a tabula rasa, right? A blank slate. David Hume talks about the mind receiving impressions. Well, these are pretty passive. I mean, it's hard to be more passive than an inert bit of rock that's just laying there waiting for the world to write itself on you. <coughs> Excuse me. Such views suggest that experience of the world is a passive affair where the mind merely receives what is given in perception. But the key Kantian insight again is that the mind is not passive in experience, but rather active. Mind constructs experience out of the raw sense data that it receives. For Kant, 
The problem was that we're not paying close enough attention to the active role that the mind plays in the constitution of our experience of the world. The rationalists were partially right, Kant thinks. We bring something to the party, something without which intelligible experience would not be possible. And the empiricists were partly right. All knowledge originates in experience. But the rationalists were wrong to believe that what we bring is ideas or content. No, says Kant, we don't start with innate content. And the empiricists were wrong to think that all knowledge is given in experience, that all knowledge is contained within the content of our experience. So from Critique of Your Pure Reason, he says, that all our knowledge begins with experience, there can be no doubt. For how should the faculty of knowledge be called into activity if not by objects which affect our senses and which either produce representations by themselves or rouse the activity of our understanding to compare or connect or to separate them and thus to convert the raw material of our sensuous impressions into a knowledge of objects which we call experience. In respect to time, therefore, no knowledge is within us antecedent to experience, but all knowledge begins with it. So notice he's, he's uh, agreeing with the empiricists that there are no innate ideas and that without experience, we would have no ideas whatsoever and no knowledge whatsoever. But that does not necessarily mean that knowledge arises from the content of experience alone as the empiricist had insisted. Quoting from Kant, he says, but although all our knowledge begins with experience, it does not follow that it arises from experience. For it is quite possible that even our empirical experience is a compound of that which we receive through impressions and of that which our own faculty of knowledge inside it only by sensuous impressions supplies from itself, a supplement which we do not distinguish from the raw material until long practice has roused our attention and rendered us capable of separating one from the other. Again, this is my emphasis here. Here Kant is pointing out that once we do have experience to work with, we can theoretically divide that experience into content and into form. We cannot make this division until we have some experience to work with, however, and even then Kant suggests it requires long practice before we can. So what he has in mind is that as we begin to receive experiences or have experiences, we just experience it as an undivided, um, complete or, or um, uh, totality. But after we've had experience, after experience, after experience, after experience, long practice, we can start to say, hey, you know, there are certain features of this experience that are always the same. And there's features which change, and then there's features which never change. And what he's going to suggest is that the features which change are the content of our experiences, and the features which never change are the form of our experiences. The content of our experiences is furnished by our sensuous impressions, right? sense data, as we might say. The form of our experience is uh, provided by the mind itself, that the mind provides or informs or makes our experience conform to a certain preset template. We'll talk about that. So again, once we do have experience, we can note the contributions of active mind in fashioning the content of our experience. Again, not by furnishing innate ideas, again, not by content, but by giving shape to that content that we get through our senses. And again, he thinks of these as categorical forms. So imagine a perfectly clear glass vase ready to receive liquid. If it were absolutely clear, we could not comprehend the form while the glass was empty. But once we began to fill the glass with something, say colored liquid or even smoke, we would then be able to separate the content of the vase 
from the form that the vase imposes on that content. So let's say we fill it up with red liquid, and then we dump that out and we fill it up with green liquid. And then we dump that out and we fill it up with smoke. And then we dump that out and fill it up with sand. Well, we notice that the red and the green and, and the smoke of the sand always take on the same form. So the form is something that's imposed by the vase. So we know about the work the vase is doing by noticing the form the vase imposes on the different content that we pour into the vase. Note further that no matter what content we fill the vase with, it will always conform to the same dependable and ultimately recognizable form. Thus, it is necessary to see human experience as having different content, but a consistent form. So the, the particulars of my day today are different than they were yesterday or the day before. And so there are different contents to my experiences day after day, week after week, month after month. And yet some things remain constant and the same. And so what Kant is saying is, well, let's, let's concentrate on that for a minute. What always remains the same? What would be the form of experience? And where does that form come from? What he suggests is we can determine not only the form, but also that the form is something we provide, our minds provide it itself. The world doesn't provide us with the form of our experience, our minds provide us with the form of our experience. So mind contributes not by furnishing innate ideas, content, but by giving a shape to the content, again, categorical forms. To understand why he says this, it's necessary to see human experience as having differing content, but a consistent form. If we were to abstract all the content from human experience, we would arrive at knowledge of the pure form of human experience. So notice something, that what knowledge we arrive at, the form of human experience, is not an element uh, of the content. We just abstracted all the content. So we are knowing something, but we're knowing something that was not provided by sensuous intuition. What we're knowing is something that is uh, the product of organizing mind, active mind. Think of the pure form of human cognition as a blank template into which the mind pours all sensory information and thus arrives at coherent experience. Alternatively, think of my very old MS-DOS, you probably don't even know what that means, based mail list program that can organize records only according to one and only one pattern. Every record of this program has the same form, record one, record five, record 10. Indeed, the form is provided by the program. In this case, it was field one, first name, field two, last name, field three, telephone number, field four, street address. So I call up record number one, and maybe that's my mom, and it's first name, last name, telephone number, street address. And I call up record number eight, and maybe that's my sister, and it's first name, last name, telephone number, street address. Because every form, uh, every record of this program has the same form. And why is that? Because the program itself organizes data according to a preset template. It can only organize data according to that one unchanging preset template. Thus, record one would read first name, last name, telephone number, street address. Record 10 would read first name, last name, telephone number, street address. My cat could walk across the keyboard as she often does, and it would go first name, last name, telephone number, street address. But again, this is just because this very simple program could only organize data according to this preset template. Thus, I have knowledge of how my 100th record or any other record for that matter, would look in broad outline. Knowledge that is a priori. So let's pause a moment here. I know, and for that matter now, you know something about my 100th record without even having to look at it. So I don't have to actually look at the 100th record to know something about it. What can I know about my 100th record? What do you know about my 100th record? Well, I'll give you, I'll ask you a question, see if you can answer it. What's the first field in my first, in my 100th record? 
What's the second and the third and the fourth? You know the form of my 100th record. Now, do you know the content of my 100th record? No, I don't know the content of my 100th record. I can't have a priori knowledge of the content. I'd actually have to look at the content to know whether it's my florist or my dentist or uh, my long lost friend from middle school. I'd actually have to look it up, right? But I can know the form independent of experience. That's why I say a priori. Without even looking at my 100th record, I can know something about it. That is, my knowledge is not grounded in the particular experience of my 100th record, although it is grounded in experience in general, experience with this program in general. Though I don't know the content of the record, I know the form because when I am referring to the program's records, I'm referring to the products of its organizing function, which does not and cannot change. Otherwise, likewise for Kant, the knowledge that Kant is pointing to is knowledge that begins with and is rooted in experience, but it is not the content of experience. So again, by reflecting on our experiences, just as reflecting on the records of my mail list program, I can uh, abstract uh, what the form is, the constant form. And likewise with human experience, I can figure out what the form of human experience is. And once I know what the pure form of human experience is, then I can know something about my 100th day uh, without actually having to get to my 100th day, right? I can know that it will adhere to a certain structural form. Our formative concepts and uh, our language do not correspond to reality, according to Kant. Rather, they in fact shape up or set up our reality as we experience it. In the act of perceiving, we impose structures on experience. So that's really the key there, right? There isn't a real distinction between perceiving and interpreting for Kant, because in the receiving of data, I interpret and shape the data according to the preset template for human experience or human cognition. No, we see material objects instead of just lights and colors. Further, note that babies don't see material objects that endure in time, etc. Now, are our minds receiving different data than the data that the minds of newborns are receiving? No. Right? Our experience is different because we are doing something different with what we receive than what babies do with what they receive. But it's not because we're receiving something different. We're taking and shaping the data and giving it a certain structure and form that the immature infant mind is unable to do at that time. What we refer to as physical objects arise in our experience due to our contributions to experience. Similarly, uh, Kant argues that we experience events in a cause and effect relationship instead of as a mere sequence of events. So just as physical uh, objects arise in our experience because of the work that active mind does in shaping that experience, we see the world as a system of causes and effects because of the active role mind plays in shaping our experience. While Hume suggested that this is merely habituated practice, Kant is arguing instead that this is a category of experience. It's a category of mind. So Hume had just said, oh, I see an A and I see a B, I see an A and I see a B, I see an A and I see a B. Then I psychologically expect a B as a result of A. And so causality was just habituation, according to Hume. Kant says, no, it's deeper than that. It's not just habituation. We are compelled to see the world as a system of causes and effects because that's how our mind shapes our experience. We necessarily see the world as three-dimensional objects that endure in space and time because that's how our minds shape our experience. And in the same way, we see the world as a, a series of causes and effects because that's how our mind shapes our experience for us. The contents of our experience alone does not give our minds the concept of causality. Actually, it's quite the reverse. It is our minds that give to our experience the structure of causality. According to Kant, 
space and time do not exist out there, independent of our experience. We impose forms of three-dimensional space and unidirectional time on our experience. And only in so doing can our intelligible experience arise. So notice very young children, uh, newborns again, they have no sense of duration. They don't experience the world as a world of objects that endure throughout time. This is why if you know the baby wants your keys and you hide them, the baby doesn't think the keys exist anymore because they lack, the baby lacks the idea of duration of objects that endure in time. We see keys. We see keys that endure in time. We don't see things that disappear and appear for no reason. But that's because of how our minds structure our experiences. The, the mature, well-functioning human cognitive system sees the world as, again, three-dimensional objects that persist in unidirectional time. Kant is here suggesting that there may be an additional kind of a priori knowledge over and above David Hume's relations of ideas. So again, what we start to see here is Kant's rejection of representational realism and the correspondence theory of truth. I hinted at this earlier, or referenced it earlier. If all our experience is mediated by the activity of mind, then we do not have access to the world as it is in itself. What Kant refers to as the noumenon, right? Things in themselves, we don't have access to that. We don't have cognitive access to that. We don't have any access to that. The objects of our experience are shaped and created by the active application of mental constitutive concepts and by categorizing mind. But this is not an argument for skepticism, according to Kant. While we can and do have precise knowledge of the world, but we have precise knowledge of the world as organized and interpreted by human cognition, what Kant refers to as phenomenal reality or phenomena. Right? So we can't know the world as it exists in and of itself, but we can know the world as it exists for our experience, as shaped by human experience. But this is all we really need. In fact, Kant would say, this is all we really typically mean when we talk about knowledge of the world. It amounts to a knowledge of the world populated by chairs and desks and laptop computers and breakfast cereals and icebergs and car keys, etc. That's the world we live in, in the sense, but that's a world of our experience, right? But of, uh, and we can know that world and we can have perfectly good, reliable knowledge of that world, but we have to be careful. That's not the world as it exists in and of itself, noumenon. That's the world as exists, as rendered by human mind and cognition phenomenon. But since that's the only world we will ever experience, that's the only world that makes a practical difference to us. What difference does it make that I can't know the noumenon? I, I can know the phenomenon and that's the world of, you know, laptop computers and philosophy students and philosophy professors and paychecks and, and the rest. That's the world of my practical exchanges. And this is the world that we can know very well. And again, Kant's point here is, this is what most people mean when they talk about the world or reality, et cetera. Maybe not certain philosophers like Plato, but it's what normal people mean when they talk about the world. And can I have knowledge of that world? Definitely. Thus, I can know some uh, future record will, uh, will be like the past. <laughs> I think I might have a slide out of place here. <clears throat> This is not grounded in my experience of that future record, but rather my experience of records in general and my acquired knowledge of pure form that all the records of the program do and must take. So I think this is a little bit out of order, this particular slide, but the point is still the same. So recall that the principle of induction as David Hume uh, looked at it was, how can I know that the future will be like the past? And you may recall the, the key to his criticism of induction is he wants to say that sentence, the future will be like the past, is not an analytic sentence. Future doesn't mean past. Past doesn't mean future. It seems to be a synthetic claim. 
but it doesn't seem to be a synthetic claim about which I could have observational evidence because I can't observe the future. So I can't know it at all, says David Hume. But Kant is saying, ah, but you can know it. Just as I can know my 100th record will have a certain character, I can know that the future will have a certain character. My 100th record will be like the previous records in certain respects, and my future experience of the world will be like my past experiences of the world in certain respects. What allows me to make that inference that the future will be like the past in uh, certain respects is my knowledge of the um, the forming, the activity of mind and the, 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 the uh, forms that my mind Im imposes on human experience. Again, I'm going to be putting it together in the future the way I've been putting it together in the past. According to Kant, the noumenal world, reality unmediated by mental categories, may exist, but it is still completely unknowable to human beings. And of course, how could this be otherwise? How could we even have an unconceptualized concept of reality? I mean, put that way, it seems to be logically impossible. We can't, <laughs> but we don't really need that. Right? So this thing that we're saying, oh, we don't have access to knowing how things are in and of themselves. Well, why wring your hands over that? It makes no practical difference. Kant is very specific about what these forms of human experience are, these categories of experience, but I'm only going to refer to a few for illustration purposes. If this were a course on epistemology or Kantian thought, we might spend more time with it, but I just want to sketch it out a little bit for you, and I kind of already have to some extent. Kant is here suggesting that there may be additional kinds of a priori knowledge over and above David Hume's relations of ideas. We already pointed out this other sort of a priori knowledge is nevertheless synthetic and not analytic. All human beings experience or must experience and conform to uh, basically three-dimensional Euclidean space. So this is part of the form of human experience. We're always going to experience the world in such a way that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, that the interior angles of a plain triangle are 180 degrees, etc. All human beings experience, will experience, must experience the world as having a um, temporal sequence of past to present to future, unidirectional time. And this will always be so for human beings. Why? Because that's how mind creates and crafts and shapes human experience. So for Kant, space and time do not name external mind-independent realities. What they really name are the blueprints by which mind constructs experience for human beings. So note what Euclid and the other geometers were discovering were not mind-independent immaterial forms, not uh, platonic ideals. What they were discovering, according to Kant, is the blueprints that the mind uses to make mental images, not mental, uh, mental images uh, and experience. It will always appear to us that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line because our minds cannot image the world in any other way. Thus, it is necessarily true claim that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. This is necessarily true synthetic claim, which means we can know it a priori. So again, here's an example of a synthetic a priori claim. Shortest distance between two points doesn't mean straight line, and straight line doesn't mean shortest distance between two points. So this is not an A equals A claim. This is an A equals B claim. But to know all A's are B's, synthetic, necessarily would require that we know a necessary a priori synthetic claim. But notice its necessity arises not from some metaphysical origins but rather from our knowledge that all human experience does, will, and must conform to this Euclidean geometric principle due to the contributions of active mind. Again, quoting from Kant, he says, 
It is therefore a question which deserves at least closer investigation and cannot be disposed of at first sight whether there exists a knowledge independent of experience and even of all impressions of senses. Such knowledge is called a priori and distinguished from empirical knowledge, which has as its source a posteriori, that is, in experience, the content of experience. Kant gives us a way of resolving some of these age-old disputes of metaphysical questions concerning reality as such. Since the claims of metaphysicians are synthetic a priori, Kant provides us with the following policy with regard to such claims. First, there are those claims that are not the rules by which we construct our experience. These claims are either analytic, all bachelors are unmarried, all sisters are siblings, all marble statues are made of stone, or contingently true, um, uh, uh, I don't know, all, all, all males, I mean, all whales are mammals, or contingently false, all swans are white. So he's basically laying out here that uh, th this first category would be either the analytic a priori or the synthetic a posteriori. Essentially, roughly, this is the, the two groups that Hume would have referred to as relations of ideas or matters of fact. So those are those claims, right? Those are not claims that um, pertain to the rules by which we set up our experience of the world. These are claims that are either uh, tautological conceptual truths or they are uh, truths that we discover through observation. Then there are those claims which state rules by which we must construct our experience. And these are true necessarily. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Every cause has an effect. The future will be like the past. And then there are those which contradict the rules by which we construct our experience and are false necessarily. The future will not be like a past. Uh, some events have no causes. And finally, there are those claims that cannot be decided by appeal to the rules of our experience at all. These then make no difference to our experience. They're not relations of ideas, they're not matters of fact, and they're not synthetic a priori claims that pertain to the rules by which we construct our experience. Uh, such as there is a mind independent physical substance, something like Locke might have said. And these are to be rejected as possible topics of knowledge. As David Hume would say, commit them to the flames, for they can contain nothing but sophistry and delusion. So notice Kant is saying you don't throw out all the synthetic a priori claims. You simply throw out those synthetic a priori claims that have nothing to do with the rules by which we construct our experience. If a true is not true because of our experiences, matter of fact, nor is it true because of the grammar or meanings of the sentences of our language, relations of ideas, there is yet a third possibility, again, Kant's synthetic a priori. The synthetic a priori knowledge is knowledge of our own rules by which we necessarily constitute reality. And again, by that I mean constitute our experience of the world. Hume's fork had only two tines and consequently left unjustified many of our most important beliefs, such as every event has a cause or the future will be like the past. Kant provides a third time to the fork. A belief can be true and necessarily true if it is justified, if it is one of those rules um, that we necessarily impose to constitute our experience. Thus, there is no point to wondering whether our concepts match up with reality. There is only reality, we, uh, rather the only reality we know or could know is the reality as we experience it. And that means as we constitute it by our minds. There is no knowable reality without our concepts. So Kant rejects the question, how can we know that our ideas correspond with the way the world really is? And he thinks that question is simply misconceived. Instead, he replaces it with, how do our mental categories constitute the world? What is the structure 
and what are the rules, the concepts or categories of human mind according to which we set up our world, the world of our experience. Now, there might be some initial resistance to Kant's view. Some might object here. The world as I constitute it for my experience is not the real world. The real world exists with or without me, independent of how I constitute it. And that is the real world, and that is what I want to know. Anything else is not genuine knowledge. But note two things about this objection. You will never see or taste or touch or hear or feel or smell this alleged real world. The world you live in, the world that makes common sense difference to you and to me, is not the ideal world of speculations dreamed up by philosophers. Here I think we can find its roots. Uh, here I think we can find the roots of pragmatism, right? Think back about William James. How interested would he be in a world that you can never see, taste, touch, smell, hear, feel, and makes no practical difference to you? Not much. If you are asking to understand the world unconstituted by mind, what sort of request would that be? Are you asking to conceive of the world without concepts? To understand the world free of human understanding? On the face of it, that appears to be a logical as well as an epistemological impossibility. Note that Kant restores a certain kind of certainty. We can be certain that the constitutive rules of our experience are permanent and lasting and dependable. Kant defended the necessity of the truths of arithmetic and geometry as those rules that have to do with the a priori forms of our intuitions of space and time. According to Kant's philosophy in general, reality is the world of our experience as we constitute it through the concepts of our understanding. Therefore, we can know it with certainty. For truth in general is of our own construction. Some might object that Kant is changing the meaning of true and knowledge. After all, we traditionally have meant by truth correspondence with some extra mental reality. But he would counter that this is precisely the picture of truth that is flawed. This is what got us in trouble in the first place, Kant would say, premised as it is on a misconception of the nature of perception. So that very idea was presuming that our mental representations uh, are merely the passive reception of information from a mind independent world. That's just not what goes on in, ob in observation and perception. Kant believes that he has shown that what we, at least non-philosopher types, normally mean by truth, knowledge and reality is not the insatiable appeal to a world beyond our experience, a la Plato, but rather the world of our experience and knowledge of the objects of experience. So when I know things about laptop computers and uh, philosophy students and philosophy professors and um, car transmissions and uh, date palms and fruit bats, when I know things about these objects, I am gaining genuine knowledge of the world, a world in part constructed by my mind. Underneath Kant's spectacular pronouncements, there is once again a return to common sense. This world, the one I stand in, touch, and see, is the real world for me. This world and only this world makes a practical difference to me and to you too, for that matter. All right, so there might be some initial objections to Kant's idea. For instance, Einstein in relativity theory talks about warped space and non-Euclidean space where the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line. So here Kant is saying, oh, it's a necessary a priori synthetic claim that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And here we have Einsteinian theory, which says that that's false. Ah, but even Einstein would cautious, uh, caution us, do not try to picture this. Do not try to image this. We can have kind of mathematical theoretical access to a world of non-Euclidean space but we don't experience a world of non-Euclidean space. We experience the world that Euclid was experiencing. Right? So those might be interesting and useful mathematical models for certain uh, physical and, and physics and astrophysics puzzles, but that's not quite the same thing as the world of our day-to-day uh, -day experience. 
Second, we can imagine maybe even achieve time travel. Right? Doesn't that show that maybe we can experience time in some other way? That doesn't necessarily follow. Think of all or, or most of the science fiction shows you've ever seen about time travel. Right? The experience of the time traveler is kind of ordinary temporal experience. First, they get in the time machine. Then they go back in time. Then they have their adventure. Then they get back in the time machine. Then they return to the present, right? So they do an A and then a B and then a C, right? So the temporal linear progressions. So what would it mean to experience time backwards? And I don't just mean experience events in reverse order. So, you know, if I play a movie in reverse, you might experience the scenes in reverse order, but you're not experiencing the move back, uh, uh, movie backwards, right? So if in the movie, uh, there's a scene where I knock my coffee cup off my desk and it smashes on the floor, and then I reverse that, well, you'd see all the pieces fly together and assemble and go into the air and land on my desk. First, in the first case, first it was on my desk, then it was in the air, then it struck the floor, then it shattered into pieces, and in the second, first it was lots of pieces, then it assembled, then it flew into the air, then it landed on my desk, but it was always a first and then, and then, and then. The experience of time is rather normal, even though it might be in reverse order. Well, what about this? Mystics talk about experience where space and time drop away and time is unreal. Yes, well, even they will claim that these experiences are ineffable, meaning not fully describable. They may simply be unintelligible as well, as Kant would suggest. This is a controversial matter, <coughs> but what, if any, knowledge does one get out of such mystical experiences? Kant would say probably precious little, and certainly you don't get science out of such knowledge, uh, such experiences. So the idea here is, what Kant would be suggesting is, well, here we have cases where the mind simply stops doing what the mind is supposed to do. Like in the case of infants, where it's too young to impose space and time on experience, or perhaps those who engage in certain uh, pharmaceutical um, altered states. And there again, the mind just stops doing what it's supposed to do on a normal basis. But that doesn't give you knowledge of the world according to Kant, that just gives you uh, experiences which are unintelligible for that very reason. Ramifications. There, are, um, there is epistemological, ah, there is epistemological justification for causality. And I have more detailed notes on this in the notes, but here we just see that a human cognition always organizes experience of the world according to the concept of causality. And so you can give a synthetic a priori defense of causality. And this answers a Hume's objection. Similarly, um, there is a, a, a epistemological justification for the principle of induction. The future will be like the past. I talked about that already. What are the metaphysical ramifications of his view? Well, metaphysics is impossible, right? That's kind of how we started this presentation. To conceive of reality, much less to talk or speculate about reality outside of space and time or transcendent reality is impossible because necessarily any such conception would use human concepts and thus be mediated by mind. These mediating concepts are perfectly serviceable for the constitution and organization of human experience. They're, that's what we need them for, that's what we use it for, and that's what's appropriate. But it's inapplicable for gaining immediate knowledge of things in themselves. Hence, we cannot have theoretical knowledge of the way things really exist apart from human experience or consciousness of them. Just as it makes perfect sense to ask, what is west of the DM building? Or what is west of San Francisco? Or what is west of Japan? Yet to ask what is west of the moon is to misapply an otherwise useful concept. This concept has a usefulness and a jurisdiction west of. But the latter question, what is west of the moon, is nonsensical because it's an attempt to apply this concept outside 
the concept's proper jurisdiction. In a similar way, to ask what is the cause of this disease, or what is the cause of my car not starting, or what is the cause of the stock market crash, all those make perfectly good sense as questions. But to ask what is the cause of reality is a misapplication of an otherwise useful concept. There is epistemological, oh, I guess this is a little bit out of, out of order, but I already said it, right? There's epistemological justification for induction, causality, and external reality on uh, uh, Kant's account here. And he can answer Hume's objections. Human cognition always organizes human experience of the world according to the concept of causality. And therefore we can be certain a priori that all human experience will have and must have the same basic character since human cognition can and uh, does always organize experience in the same way. In particular, we can be certain that every effect will, uh, effect will have a cause since that's the way our minds are always putting the world together for us. Now, this is near the end here. This opens the door to radical relativism with regard to truth. Kant opens the door, but he does not walk through it. So let me be very clear. Kant was not a relativist. Kant believed that human or empirical knowledge was subjective. In other words, I'm making up truth for me. You're making up truth for you. Uh, the person down the block is making up truth for the person down the block. Nevertheless, despite being subjective, truth is universal. Why? Because I'm making up truth for me in exactly the same way that you're making up truth for you in exactly the same way that the person down the block is making up truth for the person down the block. So for Kant, yes, knowledge is subjective. Yes, knowledge is universal and it is not relative. This is because the pure forms of experience and the categories of thought were universal to all humans. At least this is what Kant believed. Since you're running the same organizing program that I'm running, you're putting the world together in pretty much the same way that I'm putting the world together. And this is why, despite being subject subjective, we have universal truths. Notice if I write up a document in Word, and then I put it on a thumb drive and I give it to you, your computer calls it up using Word, and it calls up the same document that appears for both of us. This is because in both cases, Word is taking the data and making it conform to the same structure, form, or template. Thus, my subjective truth is the same as yours. In this way, Kant can maintain that what is true for one human is true for all humans and vice versa. Again, subjective, but universal. Now, God or aliens from another planet may have very different forms of experience and thus different knowledge and truths. But the human task of inquiry doesn't involve them, not yet at least. So these are mere speculative concerns, not practical ones about which scientists need to worry. But one might object to Kant's view. For instance, what if we do not all put the world together in basically the same way? What if women put the world together according to some female template and men put the world together according to some male template? If men are from Mars and women are from Venus, that was a book years ago, uh, then uh, we may not be experiencing the same worlds because we're building our worlds with the same input, but according to different templates. I'm running Word, but you might be running pages. Well, then we may not get the same document. Right? That's happened lots of times when students upload a document to campus using pages and I try to open it on Word. It doesn't work, right? or at least I don't get what they wrote. We are, in a very real sense, living in different worlds, and truth must be relativized to groups of cognizers. Rather than uni univalent, truth becomes bivalent or perhaps multivalent. It is potentially as multifaceted as there are minds, and there would be no basis for claiming that one worldview is privileged among this plurality of truths. If this were the case, it's unclear what could recommend one worldview over another, except perhaps prejudice or political agenda. So there are certain uh, postmodern thinkers who make exactly this claim that the idea of objective truth um, 
is very misleading and potentially excludes marginalized groups because it is silencing their voice and their way of seeing and uh, constructing their worlds uh, and, and advancing perhaps the interests of the, the politically powerful, etc. Contemporary philosophers are more likely to say that the constitutive concepts through which we construct our experience might actually be rules of language. This in turn raises the rather intriguing but controversial possibility that the world might be quite different for people who speak different languages or perhaps engage in different social uh, practices, or um, et cetera. Kant himself did not believe this, right? So again, let me emphasize, Kant thought, no, nope, there's one template, we all put the world together the same way, and there's a single universal truth that, uh, uh, that accords to everybody. But again, since he sees experience as a product of two different things, sensory input and informed uh, uh, um, the, the activity of mind, if we aren't all constructing the world according to the same template, then you can have multiple truths. Now, at the end of my notes, I have some intriguing things uh, that Kant had to say about the nature of free will and determinism. You might already be familiar with the debate between free will and determinism. Determinism is the idea that every event in the universe has a cause. It follows from that claim that human actions are events in the universe and thus human actions are caused. Now, if human actions are in fact caused, then it's not clear that they are under your, your control, free will. Right? Um, Presumably, they're caused by what? Well, determinants differ as to what they think the causes of human actions are. Maybe it's genetics. Maybe it's the environment. Maybe it's id ego, uh, super ego struggles, etc. So you have different ideas about what the causes of human behavior are. But what most scientists of human behavior suggest is that human behavior is indeed caused, and it's caused by factors that are beyond the individual's control. Free agency seems to require exactly the kind of um, freedom that determinism denies. And moral responsibility seems to require free agency. So there does seem to be this uh, tension between those who advance a deterministic worldview and those who claim that human beings should be held morally responsible for their freely chosen actions. Anyway, if you'd like to see how Kant uh, tries to reconcile that, uh, please review those notes, but I'm not going to include them here. So that concludes my remarks for today. Hope this has been helpful and valuable to you, naturally, uh, as I always conclude with this, uh, this invitation. If this is something you'd like to discuss with me further, or you have some questions or comments on you want to share, please let me know. Excuse me. And so then, until next time.